you're not phased at all by the prospect of hundreds of thousands of new visitors from China and India descending on the Maldives to enjoy this wonderful experience. That's, that's good for the Maldives, good for growth, good for tourism, and good for the environment. It's good. It's good because if you really look at, I'm, I'm, I don't know how many of you have visited uh, a, a, a neighboring um, inhabited, local inhabited island. If you really go and see that and come see this, you would see the contrast. I don't know why Sono is keeping his island so clean and neat and he's, why he is so concerned about the environment. Uh, you know, I can think of one reason why he should be. Business. Business. This is what sustains his business. Looking after the environment, keeping it the way it is, pristine, is what makes it going. So if you go to an inhabited island, if they can see exactly the same thing, if, we, if they can rationalize that in the same manner as Sonu can, we can transfer the same, ma the, way, the same way we do things here to the locally inhabited islands as well. And this is yet lacking in the model. Okay. It needs to happen. So, Minister, you are a politician, so you're entitled not to answer one of my questions, because that's part of the course of politicians. But the issue about China and India as major players now in the future of the tourism industry. I don't know why we're having so much doubt about the Chinese and the Indians. The Chinese are the, one of the oldest civilizations in the world. Indians, the same way. Why aren't they any less than anybody else? They have sustained themselves for so long. Of course, you made mistakes. They, have, they make mistakes. They have made mistakes. We talk about it. No, we're not going to. Uh, <coughs> the Chinese, I, I don't think it's really that an much of an issue. We can sustain the, the environment of the Maldives even if we have the Chinese and the Indians coming. Okay. This, is, this is our industry. We dictate the rules here. Yes, that's right. We can do that. Right, that's an important point. We dictate the rules here. Good word, of course, in a new democracy. Um, <laughs> you, are the, you are the UN, a UN ambassador for biodiversity. So when Costa says this industry is on the whole beginning to make a real difference for biodiversity, can, do you go with that, with that thesis, which is a really important part of the emerging rationale? I, uh, I would respectfully say I think it could go that way, and I think it should go that way, but I think to not to focus on the negative, but in terms of this question of angel versus devil, um, and picking up on a thread of what the minister just said. Um, I think that, like we were talking about the narrative, I think, I think the tourism industry is, has become extremely attuned to the narrative of ecological sustainability, because, be, in the sense that it's become an enormous part of the marketing of the industry. Eco, green, you know, uh, biodiversity, community benefit. You, you now see these, these splattered all over the marketing. But, but I do think the question is, is, have they embraced just the narrative or have they embraced the practice of those things? And let me, let me just stipulate by saying, before I, well, I say what I'm about to say, there, there's, there's definitely people and companies that, uh, that are, are walking the walk. They're, they're marketing it, and they are actually walking the walk. I think we're sitting in one of them. Um, but on the whole, I would have to say, in my experience, looking specifically at this around the world, I think there's a dangerous disconnect <coughs> betw overall between the narrative and the practice. And, and I don't think, and it's not the fault of the tourists, it's the fault of the industry. And it's, and it's a little bit, to some degree, the fault of the of the tourism media which regurgitate mm. the marketing without really drilling into what constitutes eco or what what are the standards and i think the the travel the travel media that's, and the travel agencies many of whom have have set themselves up as arbiters of what's green and what's eco frankly just regurgitate a lot of nonsense about about <laughs> who's doing what without doing any kind of real investigation of that. Okay. Um, and I, now let me just say this. I think that people don't, people don't tend to look at, when people talk about extractive industries, they, talk, they think about mining and, and lumber and things like that. But tourism is an extractive industry. Mm. And, and, and it, 
it, it is just as much as any of those other industries, it, it runs the substantial risk of, of deteriorating the natural resource capital that it's based on. And, and I think that, um, I, I think the minister's right. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's really on the, the, vi the visitors. I think that the, 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 the national institutions uh, have to regulate the rules. They have to say to the tourism industry, these are the standards that, that we insist that you set uh, just as much as we regulate any other uh, extractive industry. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Carlson a bit later how many countries are doing that. I might ask you whether Kenya is doing it, given your experience uh, in the Matai Mara. Um, on biodiversity and the narrative, Sonia, yeah. how, how does all that play out? Well, um, if it wasn't for tourism, the, shark, the turtles would have disappeared long ago. Um, we founded a campaign with an NGO called EcoCare. We were funding them, putting leaflets in hotel rooms and so on. And um, we were making some progress. And then we actually started to get the big tour operators, Crony UK, largest tour operator into the Maldives. They started writing letters. And MD Sue Biggs wrote a lovely letter to um, the president at the time. And overnight, turtle products were banned. Um, so that's the impact of the tourists. They, they saved the turtle. Um, sharks, the same thing, a lot of campaigning, finally, sharks are banned. But on that side of biodiversity, we've really uh, got the low-hanging fruit, you know, the turtles are big species, the sharks are big species. Uh, the problem that I have, and the, my, my main concern is, they're all those small things, firstly these tiny little things, when you go diving, you know, the ghost pipe, fish, that beautiful coral, they, they're not as, how do you say, big, they're not like your panda or your, your, your shark. So. Um, how do we now get the narrative to that level where we start talking about the more fragile parts which are being destroyed? So sharks may not be hunted and there is still a bit of illegal thing going on, but um, you know, what about the, the, the coral and so on? So I think that side, and also the other point on the narrative um, for hoteliers, at Six Senses, um, we've been starting to liken our properties to an Apple, you know, an iPad. So the hotel should be considered as the iPad and then what you do are the apps. So, and, and that's what's essential in terms of the experience because um, a, a successful resort is like a pointless painting, it's all the dots. So the hotels, like you know, the basic kitchen and the generator room and the, the basic rooms, that's your canvas. And then it's the apps that really define and differentiate you. So for example, the open air cinema we had last night or the observatory. And there are some apps now that we're developing within Six Senses, like that are all about community and sustainability. So for example, a very successful app, you know, to use the Apple term, is um, a restaurant in the local community, whether it's the Benz's restaurant five miles outside Seneva Kiri, where you take a boat and there's a local hut where you have no choice at all, which is super luxurious today when they, people are making too many decisions all the time. Um, and it just depends on what Benz has found from the market or what Laurie's doing with the housewives in Marlos where once a week they cook meals for our guests. Um, very, very popular. Um, tours to the local community. So I think there are a lot more apps we can develop and that you know, comes to that whole point of the narrative. I think the hotelier needs to look at resorts, especially in the leisure side. Forget city hotels, that's a different thing. And sometimes I think we mix a hotel as being the same thing as you get in the city. And, um, and I think if we treat it like an iPad and then add these local apps, I think there's, um, you okay. know, that's, that's the way future. Excellent. Forward. Right. We've got time for uh, it's quite a short session, as you've probably spotted on the, on the program. Um, and we're going to try and keep it a little bit more to time than some. So I've got, I think we've probably only got time for about three more, which sounds a bit draconian. Right. Um, Jeffrey is one. So can I see two others? Thank you very much. And so could I have the second microphone over there? And then we'll take them all. And is there a third? Am I missing? Uh, thank you. Yes. You, sir. And was there one other I missed? In which case we'll take four. No, you're the third. So if we have the first microphone here with uh, Jeffrey, please. And then the second microphone with the gentleman there. With the gentleman there. You wouldn't mind. Thank you. And then the third microphone with you. Go for it, Jeffrey. It's working. No, it's, it's not. not. Working. A little bit louder. Uh, and did you? Can did you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Can we have a test of your microphone, please, sir? Yeah, you can first. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I just wanted to touch on. Uh, who are you, sir? Uh, Sima, uh, a member of the President's Advisory Council thank on you. Climate Change. And also, I work for a consulting company, so I get to interact a lot with the tourist resorts and some of the environmental issues which they have in the Maldives. And I wanted to just uh, briefly mention about the issue which for a politician it might not be easy to talk in a public forum, the Chinese Indian uh, tourist arrivals perhaps to the Maldives and what kind of issues are there. I think as far as we see it, the issue is that of not being prepared. Uh, it's not that uh, the Chinese or the Indians are in any way lesser tourists uh, in terms of their environment friendliness, but because we, uh, we do not have proactive communication if you look at the brochures, leaflets, there's everything in English, French, German, Italian, Spanish perhaps to a lesser extent, but it's all there. The instructions are there, but when it comes to the Chinese and Indian, you hardly find any information about what to do, what not to do. And also, uh, even in the promotion uh, and marketing, we don't see uh, the environmental awareness being uh, transmitted to them before they arrive here. So often, uh, the results are not really ready when they come and then they do something, then even the management, they do not have people who could go and then tell them uh, politely in Chinese that this is not allowed in the resorts of Maldives. So I think uh, the importance is to be proactive, to be ready and to pass on the same information and perhaps we will be seeing the same kind of results we normally find with the Swiss tourists in the Maldives. Everyone says the Swiss are the uh, guardians of the environment when they come, they are like a policeman. Uh, when they come to the protecting the reefs. So perhaps the same thing can be done with a bit of proactive communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Minister, you might want to respond to that. Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Lima from Telegraph. Um, let's up the ante a bit on this air travel. I just want to. Can't hear you. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, I'm Jeffrey Lima from the Telegraph. Just want to up the ante a bit on this air travel thing. Because I wonder whether the way the environmental pressure groups have concentrated on it, though it has helped the, I think helped the airline industry improve, but it has not in the wider sense been totally counterproductive. Because five or six years ago, there was a real sense, particularly in Europe, and for certain in the States, of people wanting to shrink their carbon footprint. And almost everything they could do was beneficial, like um, inspecting your house, or driving your car better, or getting a cheaper car. Um, a bit more particular. almost all that's incentive in But the environmental pressure groups in their wisdom chose to target the one thing that people really didn't want to do, which was fly. Or <laughs> those, but also because they might have an auntie in the United States or a son or a daughter in Australia. And by sort of making flying the touchstone of whether you're green or not, I wonder if that has not been one of the reasons why you've falling off. Okay. Um, I'm not sure everyone heard that, but it was. It's, uh, but essentially, the, the thrust is: have the environmentalists been their own worst enemy in attacking flying, rather than working out how to make a more responsible role for flying in the in the economy? Yes, please. Yeah, number three. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name's Paul. I uh, do communications in the president's office. I had a question for Sonu actually, and it was picking up on something that um, Ed had referred to earlier, which is almost about using Maldives soft power with um, helping to sort of educate and uh, raise the game for some of the tourists that come here, and you have almost a, a million tourists a year come to the Maldives. Um, to what extent um, can you engage tourists in environmental initiatives without them sort of feeling that you're somewhat ramming it down their throat and they sort of say, okay, time out, I'm here on holiday, I don't want to hear anything more about the, the turtles. Right. <laughs> so, right, I'm going to start with you, Sonu. So I, I really like that. How do you do all this exciting educational information stuff, whichever language it's in? How do you do it without being boring, preachy, and sort of evangelistic? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it, it's uh, you have to make it exciting and interesting. And um, in in fact, um, whilst we do a lot, John Hardy, um, who's here, felt that um, we should do more in terms of taking everyone to Eco Centro. Um, we started doing it and we found that our guests actually enjoy that. And it's, it's, it's little bits of narrative, 
in the menu. So, for example, if we've bottled our own water, you know, there's just a little line explaining that. It's, it's something that we have to work on more as an operator in terms of with our menus, with our A to Z. Ava actually crafted the A to Z, the origins of the A to Z rather than a compendium was Ava's initiative. And she actually wrote the first one. And, um, you know, she's full of these um, sustainable issues. And people found it fascinating. And so many of our guests actually said, oh, I really enjoyed reading the compendiums. Um, so, um, and, and you just make it a fun, interesting narrative, try and put it in, you know, one sentence. Um, I think that's important. Um, on this whole issue of the soft side, which um, you, you're talking about, Ed and Paul, I, one point I'd like to make, and a um, you know, question for Minister of Tourism, Mariam, uh, and Aslam, is, um, you know, there has been talk about a golf course in the Maldives. And um, I can see some people looking at that with, and, and finding it very attractive because it suddenly opens up the market to tourism. My personal view as um, an operator here for 15 years, um, having interacted with the type of clients that come here, is I feel it would be a disaster and it would actually send the Maldives backwards. Because firstly, die-hard golfers need at least 10 courses. Most um, competitive okay. tourist destinations like Mauritius, the Algarve, they have 10, 15 golf courses because that's what a golfer wants to do. They want to go a different course each day. So having one course in a destination doesn't really help. But what it does do is it, it sends this message which undermines all the good messages that have been created um, you know, over the last 10, 15 years. So it, it just suddenly adds that element of cynicism. You know? no, it is working. Just uh, very shortly and sweetly, I'd like to say to Tony that I've, I've made my amends with Eva because uh, the golf course is going to be a floating golf course. And I've assured her that all the uh, processes of uh, water ma uh, wastewater management and so on will be done in an environmentally sustainable way. So we are fine on that score. It's going to be an environmentally sustainable golf course. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I think it's an image issue. I was talking about the okay, image okay, of the movie, okay. but yeah. Fully so biting yeah. golf ball. So we're gonna we're gonna go the long um, way down this route, haven't we? Well, I mean, see, my job is never easy. So I'll pass on to Aslam to save me. Oh, thank you, Aslam. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your job as well? <laughs> just a, just one comment on that is that in an island nation that has to create its water through desalinization, there is no such thing as a sustainable golf course because it's one of the most water-intensive recreations on the planet, and I don't yeah. think that it's, it's actually Even possible. if you find grass that likes but salt water, you still need it. But, let me, but let me say it. something. I, I agree with Tano about something else, which is what he's talking about is what I think it, the tourism industry has to also it's confront to some degree, which is the idea of appropriate experience. And, and to tie it to something I know you asked about, like in terms of how is, how is tourism interacting with biodiversity, mm -hmm. Um, one of the things we've seen in Kenya, where I've done most of the work that I've done on, on these issues, is that, sure, like um, in, in the huge Amboseli Sabo ecosystem, which is one of the largest intact grassland migratory systems in Africa, um, you have some of the most famous national parks in Kenya. Um, there, there, was a, there was a colossal crash in the lion population in that area, largely because of conflict with livestock. Um, uh, in the community lands, in the Maasai community lands in between the national parks. Um, the, the tourism industry has played a very significant role in focusing attention on, on mitigating lion uh, conflict through compensation programs and a number of other types of things. So you can point to efforts that, that certain uh, six senses like boutique safari operators have made some, some very uh, substantial effort toward uh, helping do the kinds of things you were talking about with the turtle. But, but you have to be very, very careful, I think, to call that uh, a, what I would call a deep success by the tourism industry. Because without naming names, one of the, one of the main hotelier safari lodges that was engaged in that effort for lions which ha happens to be, you know, a very, very famous uh, chain luxury safari operator who, who splatters eco and, 
and community benefit all over and also happens to be owned 20% by National Geographic is also operating a hotel in a dry savanna environment in which they, they, each individual suite has a plunge pool in it and the water from that is trucked by diesel tanker trucks twice a day from community water sources. Now, it doesn't matter if you're working on mitigation of, of mortality in some macrofauna species that's a big sexy species. If you're depleting the watershed in a way that's totally unsustainable, you're fostering the kind of conflict uh, that, that's ultimately going to take down that wildlife. You're, 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 you're doing much, much, much more fundamental damage through your unsustainable operational practice than some sort of like sexy little program that you do for the lions that you tell your guests about. And, and so, so you, you can't, I think everybody's got to be very careful in, in measuring sort of the, 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 the depth of these successes because you, you can be engaging in certain programs to engage your tourists and, and create benefit around certain big species, but species, species preservation is totally irrelevant uh, in, a, in a world in which we know that the underlying ecosystem that supports that species has got to be preserved. And if the tourism operator is degrading the underlying ecosystem, it doesn't matter if they're helping save turtles or sharks or lions or anything. So that's what, that's what I mean when I talk about drilling a little deeper because you will see a lot of these lodges celebrated in the travel media for their work on lions without ever asking a question about how they source their water, which is frankly much more important. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a Very really good point. Good point. Yeah. Before I come to the minister, so, um, you don't have to respond about no, the lines in no, the Serengeti. I'm going to ask the minister a moment whether he thinks there is a prospect of the Maldives being held to be the world's most sustainable tourism destination nation in five years' time. What's the benchmark that the ministers are going to have to aim for as the, as the nation doing the best possible job on sustainable tourism today? So scale up from micro to national scale, who do you say, which, which country in the world is doing the best job? I think there are a number of different countries that are doing different levels of success. I think it's, it's very hard to say this country is doing the best job. Okay. I think you can look at, at, at in different models, and we're talking about an island nation here. We can look at the Community Conservancy Program in Namibia, which has had tremendous success, I think, on a conservation basis and biodiversity and ecosystem protection basis. I also think that in a country such as Belize, which is a partial island nation, yeah. which has launched in the last two years a national sustainable tourism master plan, which is guiding not just individual yeah. resorts, but the entire overarching industry, supply chain, and so on. So I think uh, you know, we're seeing now the emergence of countries creating national sustainable tur tourism master plans for the entire country, urban and rural which wasn't really taking place even five and six years ago. Okay, and that's a really I, good you know, benchmark. Thank you very much for that. So, you've got your benchmarks. The ambition level is clear. You know what to do? Yeah, we have to do that, isn't it? You're not coming here, though. Yeah. So we have to do that. Uh, very true. I mean, without, without the environment, without the sustainability of, of the ecosystem here in the Maldives, there is no tourism in the Maldives. <laughs> There's nothing else. We, 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 we've got no, no coal to mine, no uh, uh, natural gas to, uh, um, to extract, uh, no gold, nothing. All what we have is the environment we have. That's what we sell, that's what we eat, and it's on that we live on. And I think uh, the government understand it very well. The people who come here understand it very well. The people of this country understand it, maybe not in the same manner as you understand it. They, they, they see things, in a, for them it's part of their life. So they might not, if you go ask them, they might not be able to explain it to you as mm. you may explain it to someone else. But it, it's in there, and, and this we understand. Um, so definitely, we're going to be, are we going to be strict with our regulations for the Chinese developers? Yes, we're not going to have double standards. In fact, we do have double standards for, for, for tourism. A lot, oftentimes, we are criticized for being, having double standards for, for resort development and for development for local inhabited islands. We are more strict with the environmental regulations for the resort 
simply because I, we think the, the results can sustain it. They can do that. The day we think the local inhabitants can do that and they can afford to do it, we will impose that upon them as well. So uh, we, we, the benchmarks you said, we will definitely meet them. Uh, and um, uh, Mr. Zulfa, we will definitely have to think about the golf course. <laughs> Just, I'd actually, I'd like to step back on the golf course if I No, no, can. no, I, I don't um, want to end on the golf course because okay. the golf course is a sort of interesting uh, story. But I, uh, any okay. concluding thoughts about the, the tourism I debate at a bigger level? There's no more time for any more questions from the floor. Okay. I'm sorry, Anton's telling me to shut up. So I will in a moment. No one has answered Jeffrey's question about the wretched NGOs and why they were so bad about aviation and so on. I feel it's a bit hard to ask my colleagues on the platform about that. I agree that. with Jeffrey. I think that's uh, <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting point because if you feel if if you if you have if it's, if you feel it's futile and you can't do anything about it, or it's up to a couple of airlines to do something about it or aviation companies, then that that does make you feel helpless. So it becomes quite frustrating, and and then you 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 have this sort of cynical attitude towards life and the fact that you know perhaps you should just live the best whilst you can, sort of thing. So I, I think that's, um, yes, it's, it's, it's a very mm -hmm. valid point, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we know what Richard Branson would say if he was sitting on this platform in answer to that question as well. Good, well, listen, I'm sorry I've all been a bit breathless, but uh, we were in slightly in catch-up mode after lunch, as you could tell, just to sort of get back, a little bit back on track, as it were. The next session starts, as I understand it, immediately after this, so we're going to get off the stage and the next session starts after that. Thank you very much and thanks to our panelists.